And amen. We're going to go right to the scripture. This is Luke chapter 24, verse 1 through 5. Look at this. It says, On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices that they had prepared, and they went to the tomb. So we're going to pause right there. Keep that slide up, please. The women, the women came to the tomb. So we've been talking about this for the last few weeks, that during the entire time of, of Jesus being arrested and going through the trials and his beatings and, and, and the eventual death on the cross, there was a group of ladies led by Mary Magdalene, and there was four of them at least, that followed Jesus every step of the way. And even when everybody else abandoned Jesus, this group of ladies did not abandon Jesus. They stayed with him. And they come to the tomb very early in the morning, it says. It's probably right at dawn. And they come bringing spices. Do you know why? Because they think he's still dead. You get the joke? They think he's still dead. They went to the tomb. They found the stone, rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of Jesus. Next slide. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. What does it mean, gleamed like lightning? See, this is before Marvel and science fiction and movies and all this kind of stuff. They're seeing angels right now, and they don't know what this means. Right? Like these two people, these two men, they're glowing and they don't have words to describe it except it's like, it's like lightning shooting out of their clothes. I love the Bible language. But the men said to them, the angels said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Amen. Amen? He has risen. So they are, they're, they are the first ones to get the news these ladies are, these four women led by Mary Magdalene. They are the first ones to see the empty tomb and to get the miracle. And that's so important. Why? Because in, in the time that this was written, the ancient times, women were not considered legal testimony in court. Did you know that? And so it's like God's having a little laugh here that he's making the very first witnesses to the resurrection women. And he honors them and he lifts them up. And you're going to see more and more of that as we go along. And then Mark gives us an additional detail. So the, the angels are still speaking here and they say, but go and tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you into Galilee and then you will see him just as he told you. So go tell his disciples, you're supposed to take this message, you're supposed to take this news to his disciples, and, and, come on class, and Peter. Why would you say take this message to his disciples and Peter? See, if I said that I'm preaching this entire sermon to this room and Sage, <laughs> raise your hand, Sage. If I said I'm, I'm preaching this entire sermon to this room and sage, you would know what that means. It means sage really needs this sermon today, amen? <laughs> like he's, you know, he really needs it. Like we all need it, but he really needs it. See, this is what the angel is doing. It says, go give this message to the disciples because they need it, but give it to Peter. And this is amazing to me because it's our very first indication. That when Jesus comes out of the tomb as the resurrected king, he is on his way to resurrect Peter. Because Peter is dead. What do you mean Peter's dead? Peter, the leader of the disciples. Peter, who Jesus called the rock that he would build his church on. Peter fails, and he doesn't just fail. He fails magnificently. He denies that he even knows Jesus. At Jesus' darkest moment, Peter denies that he even knows him three times. As we said last week, when Jesus goes to the tomb, Peter, or when Jesus goes to the cross, Peter isn't even around. He's off in his cave in brokenness, bitterness, feeling completely worthless. Have you ever been there? Have you ever failed and felt worthless? This is Peter. And so the message gets sent from the angel to the disciples. Go let the disciples know. And Peter, ask yourself the question, how did the angel know to get that word in there? Because Jesus told him. Jesus said, make sure that you point out Peter specifically. For the three weeks of this series, we've had 
these cards in the back. One of our wonderful artists, her name's Ashley, put these together. And we've been looking at the scenes of the crucifixion. And today you've got scenes of the resurrection, of the resurrection of Peter. Now these, this one here, it shows um, a race. And here's how the race happened. After the angel told these four women what the message was to take to the disciples, they did. They took it to the disciples. They went where we believe is the upper room where the last supper had happened in Jerusalem. And they come and they give the message to the disciples. And Peter and John both hear it. They hear this message that Jesus has been risen from the dead. They don't know if they believe it yet, but they bolt for the tomb. Peter especially bolts for the tomb. And they run as fast as they can. And in the Gospel of John, he tells us this really interesting tidbit. He says that John reached the tomb first. Now, I think that's funny. Why do you have to document for thousands of years in the Scripture that you won the race, John? Good grief, John. Like, I imagine Peter right next to him saying, you know, it wasn't a race. We were just running really fast to the same place. Why's it got to be a race? Because I won. That's why it's... Anybody know that friend? It's always got to be a competition. So anyway, so John gets there first. John gets there first, and at the edge of the tomb, he just stays there. He doesn't go inside, the scripture tells us. But as soon as Peter catches up with him, Peter goes right inside, and he finds the burial clothes there, folded up, and Jesus not there. Jesus is in new clothes. Amen? Amen? He's in new clothes. Peter, it says... He doesn't know what to make of it. The implication is he can't put it all together. It's all too overwhelming. He's not sure he believes yet. But the scripture says, John, the disciple who Jesus loved, he believed and he was ready. Amen? So then the two guys wander away and they're not sure what to make of all this yet because they haven't seen Jesus. They've only seen an empty tomb. And then we come to this one right here. And we really got artsy with this particular graphic. Um, it's important to us. It comes out of a prophecy made about Jesus in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 11, I believe. Do we have the slide for that? There it is. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse, it says. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. Now, what in the world does that mean? Jesse was the father of David. And what it's saying is the line of ancient Israeli kings that God said he would always bless and would never come to an end. It found its end in Jesus Christ. He was the final king that came in David's line. But what happened to that king is that tree was cut off and it was a stump. That's the crucifixion. Jesus died. And the scripture is saying, but what's going to happen next is amazing because a whole new branch is going to grow out of that stump and that's a picture of resurrection and it will have more fruit than you can possibly imagine. What fruit is it talking about? All of us. The descendants spiritually of Jesus Christ, all who would come to him in faith. So he is the king, the resurrected king. Now what I didn't tell you about the race is that when the ladies had gone to the disciples and told them the message... I think Mary Magdalene ran back with the two disciples. I think she was the third member of the race. And when she got back, she had no idea that Jesus was really resurrected. Again, she just thought the tomb was empty. She couldn't put it together. Now, the scripture tells us that the tomb was in a garden. And she came and she ran into a man. And she thought the man was the gardener because she didn't recognize him. And so she says to the gardener, she's like, can you tell me where the body is? Because I've got these spices still. Can you just tell me where the body is? I'll put the body back and then I'll be able to treat it. Would you just tell me where the body is? And the gardener, of course, is Jesus. And he says, Mary to her. And as soon as he says Mary to her, she recognizes the sound of his voice saying her name to her. And she says, Rabboni. And that's a formal title for a teacher. And she embraces him. And it's a beautiful, tender moment. The first person to see the risen Christ in person. Again, a woman, Mary Magdalene. Isn't that great? Now, one question comes to our minds, why doesn't she recognize him? One scholar I read said, you know what? When people are resurrected, we don't actually know what happens to their body physically. They come back, but maybe they come back somewhat changed. So like if you knew somebody that maybe you knew them in their teens, 
but then you never saw them again until maybe 15, 20 years later. If you saw them, you might walk past them in a crowd because they've changed. But if you stop and you take a good look and you look in their eyes, maybe hear the sound of their voice, then you would recognize them. Does that make sense? I think this is the kind of behavior that we see from people who run into Jesus and they don't recognize him at first. And it happens a lot in the resurrection accounts. I haven't said this yet, but after Jesus rose from the dead, he actually stayed on earth for 40 days, making multiple appearances to many different groups of people. At one point, he even saw 500 people all at once in a crowd who all reported to have seen him. I'm just giving you guys a taster today of some of the appearances that he made. So the very next appearance then is right here. And this guy's got the blindfold on because these two disciples, now they're not the main 12 disciples, but these are two kind of unknown disciples. One's named Cleopas. They're walking on the road to Emmaus. And you guys heard the the scripture read about this in the video. And they're walking along and Jesus appears to them, just kind of walks alongside them. They don't know it's him either, just like Mary. They don't recognize him at first. And they take this long walk to this other city. And all along the way, Jesus explains to them, again, they don't know it's him though, but he explains to him that the Christ was always supposed to suffer and die. And he goes back to the Old Testament and he shares them passage after passage, probably Psalm 22, Psalm 69, probably the servant songs out of Isaiah. He shares all this stuff with them and say, see all these prophecies that he fulfilled? Didn't you know this was coming? And he gives them all of that. Some of you guys have read the Gospels before. And you'll see that it'll talk about Jesus doing something or saying something. And then it stops and says, he did this to fulfill this Old Testament prophecy. I think this is the moment where the disciples learned how much Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament prophecy. So he's walking along with them. And as they go, they eventually stop and they have dinner together and he goes to break bread. And as soon as he goes to break bread, they see him and they recognize him for the very first time. And then Jesus disappears. So if you're a Marvel person and you're trying to count superpowers in the risen Jesus right now, that was teleportation. Got it? Because there's more. Okay. So these guys have this amazing interaction with Jesus. And afterward, they know the entire walk had been with Jesus. And so they run back to Jerusalem. And they got to tell the disciples that they've seen Jesus. So they kind of burst into the room where the disciples are. And they're like, we saw him. And the other disciples, and I got this verse for you. This is Mark. Nope. This is Mark 14. No, Luke 24. If I just keep saying words, I'll eventually get there. Um, No, so it says, within the hour, they, that's those two disciples, were on their way back to Jerusalem. And there they found the 11 disciples and the others who had gathered with them, who said, the Lord has really risen, and he appeared to Peter. So this is important. So they've come back. Disciples are like, yeah, we know he's alive. They're so pumped. But they say, and he appeared to Peter. Now, if you've been studying this for a while, and you've been coming to Easter services all your life, maybe, you've never really heard about the appearance that Jesus made to Peter. Because even in the Jesus movies, we suddenly see Jesus shows up in the room, and there's all the 11, and he says, put your hand, you know, he does the whole thing. But we never get a private meeting between Jesus and Peter. And that's it. That it's not just said there, it's actually said in 1 Corinthians 15 as well. It affirms that before Jesus saw anybody else, after Mary, he had a private meeting alone with Peter. I think that's a big deal. I think it's also a big deal that none of the gospel authors actually give us a window into what happened at that meeting. It's like a mystery meeting with the door closed. It's like they said things in that meeting that were maybe too personal between them and we're not supposed to know because Peter had denied him three times and Peter was broken and this is the first time that he sees Jesus again face to face and what happened? Maybe they embraced. Maybe Jesus forgave him. Maybe Jesus said, you know what? Those three denials, dude, that was a bad moment. But I died for you. I died for those three denials. And I love you. 
And maybe those words got said, but they're not written down, and we don't know, but we know this moment happened, and you're going to see some excitement from Peter in just a little bit, but I want you to know that that meeting happened because Jesus came to rescue Peter. Amen? Okay, so next, after that meeting happened, then Jesus does finally show up to the disciples, all gathered together in this room. And, and it says, it's so funny in the scripture, it says that the door was locked for fear of the Jews, and then all of a sudden Jesus was among them. So back to superpowers again, he can walk through walls. So I love that. So he walks through the wall, just kind of appears um, in front of them, and then he says, give me some food to eat. Feels weird, doesn't it? Jesus is hungry. He's trying to prove to them that he's a physical body. He says, give me some food to eat, and then he eats in front of them. And then he holds out his hands and says, I want you to put your fingers in the, in the scars that I have. The book of Revelation tells us that Jesus will continue to be known by his scars throughout all eternity. It will be his one distinguishing identity to us. We'll look for the one with the scars. And so they got to do that. And some of you guys know Thomas wasn't there. And then there's another meeting with Thomas as well. But this is big, big, big. And then we finally get to the fish breakfast the fish breakfast. And this happens in the book of John, chapter 21, the fish breakfast. Now, before I do this last one, I've got to do a flashback. I've got to give you some backstory. So this flashback scene happens in Mark, chapter 14, verse 26. And let me set the scene for you because we won't understand the fish breakfast until we get this scene. Are you with me? Okay, in this scene, Jesus has just had the Last Supper, and he's on his way to get arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. On his way to get arrested, and he says this to the disciples. On the way, Jesus told them, all of you will desert me. For the scriptures say, God will strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised from the dead, I will go ahead of you to Galilee and meet you there. If we could just pause right there. So Jesus is telling the disciples, they're on the way, he's about to get arrested, and he's like, just so you know, all of you are going to abandon me. Now, why would he say that? And notice he doesn't say, like, you should really try hard not to abandon me. Like, sometimes we read stuff in the scripture, you ever notice this? And we read it with a tone, like a really dark, kind of guilty, kind of pushy tone from Jesus. And sometimes that's just not there, by the way. That's just like your old Sunday school teacher coming through, maybe. Jesus isn't being dark or depressing here. He says, this moment is going to happen, and you're all going to abandon me. And he lets them know, and he says, this has been prophesied. This is going to happen. Now, why would he, out of kindness, why would he ever tell them? I think he tells them so that when it comes, they won't be shocked. And so that they won't be crushed by it. See, when my wife and I do some premarital preparation for couples, one of the things that we say to them is, you know what? A day's going to come where you guys are going to fight. A day's going to come after you're married, and you're going to hurt each other really bad. You might even fall out of love for a season. Shocking. Why in the world would we tell them that? Here's why. Because Disney has been telling them all their life that everything's going to be rosy and they're going to ride off into the sunset. And if we don't tell them the truth before they get there, they're going to think they didn't find their soulmate and we better get divorced and try again. Where are you at, married people? You know what I'm saying is true. So why do we warn them? We warn them to prepare them. We don't warn them to say work hard and never fight. That's not the point. So Jesus warns them. Jesus is being kind to them. And look at how Peter responds to this. This is verse 29. Peter said to him, even if everyone else deserts you, I never will, Jesus. Why? Because I'm better, Jesus. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, Peter, this very night before the rooster crows twice, you will deny three times that you even know me. Peter fights Jesus, which is always a bad idea. And he says, I know you just said that, and I know you said it was prophesied, but I never will, Jesus. And he doesn't just say, I'll never abandon you, Jesus. He says, even if everyone else does, I won't. <laughs> see, he looks at the yahoos next to him and says, see them, Jesus? They might blow it, 
but not me. I'm better. I'm more holy. I'm stronger. I get better faith. I know the Bible. Like, I could go on and on and on, Jesus. You want to see my resume? I'm better. And here's what's wrong with that. Jesus was trying to help. But what had gone on here is that Peter had built an identity on comparison. Peter had built an identity on the fact that he was better than the rest of them. The reason Jesus said, on this rock, Peter, you're a rock, and on this rock, I will build my church, Peter had assumed that was because he was something. And he misunderstood. We'll see what qualified Peter later on. But he misunderstood. He thought he had to be the best in the pack, and he made the whole thing about comparison. And don't we do that in our humanity? Come on. It's not just that we have to have a good education. We have to have a better degree than our parents did. We have to have a better degree than other people around us. It's not just the kind of house that's got to be a nice roof over our heads. It's got to be the best house in the neighborhood, or it's got to be better than them, or just as good as them. And our kids have to be this way, and the boat has got to be this way. And we do comparison all the time. And of course, all of us do comparison, but Peter made comparison the foundation of his life. And that's identity. And man, hasn't social media just taken this to a whole other level? Because I don't just compare my life to others anymore. I have got instantaneous affirmation of my likes and shares and followers. Every move that I make, I know exactly how I compare to other people. And guys, we've been living with this in our culture for over a decade, and we don't even know what it's doing to us. Now I got your attention. Peter built built the foundational stones of his life on the idea that he was a better performer spiritually than the disciples. And so when Peter went and he denied Jesus three times, It wasn't just that he sinned. It wasn't just that he failed. It was that it crushed his definition of himself. He didn't know who he was anymore. How could he be the leader anymore? How could he be enough anymore? So let's get to the fish breakfast. Verse 3, John 21, verse 3. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. Now, we don't know how many days this was after Sunday. This could have been Tuesday. This could have been Wednesday, Thursday. We just know it's the third appearance Jesus made to his disciples is on this seashore. So Peter wakes up one morning and says, or actually it's at night. He says, I'm going out to fish. And all the other disciples say, we're going to go with you, Peter. Why? Because even though he doesn't have the title anymore, he's still a leader and people are still following him. He's going fishing. They're going fishing. So they went out and they got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. All night long, caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. Now, Jesus is standing on the shore, and he says, did you catch anything? And they're like, no, random guy. Thanks for reminding us, though. (laughs) And he says, why don't you take your nuts and throw it on the other side of the boat? Sure, random guy, okay, because they don't recognize him. And they cast the nets on the other side of the boat. So many fish come into the nets that it almost sinks the boat. So many fish come into the nets. And it's amazing. And there's this moment where the apostle John, it says the one that Jesus loved, he recognizes that this miracle had happened before. Right at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, when he first called James and John and Peter and those guys, this same miracle of a, of a miraculous fish, fish catching that almost sinked the boats had happened. So verse 7, the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. He knows. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him for he had taken it off and he jumped into the water. I love Peter's enthusiasm, Right? Like, he's like, I'm going for it. Like, you guys could row back with all the fish, but I'm diving in and swimming to shore because I got to be with Jesus. See, that's what tells me that at that meeting that they had, that first meeting that him and Jesus had had, it must have been good because now he's so excited 
to be with him. And he's not fearing judgment anymore. So Jesus is on shore. He's waiting for Peter and all the other guys to come back. And he's made a coal fire on the beach, it says. He's made this coal fire and he's cooked bread for them. Already the bread is done and ready to go. And then he tells the disciples, why don't you bring some of that fish over? We're going to fry that fish as well. I don't know if it's fried, but in my mind it's fried because the best fish is fried. Made by my dad with just this batter that's just amazing. So that's, that's how it went. But... The important thing that we're supposed to get here is that you've got bread and you've got fish, but Jesus made the fire, and Jesus is doing the cooking, and the disciples are sitting around, and Jesus is serving serving them, waiting on them hand and foot, because our Lord is a servant, amen? It's just his nature. He's a servant. So what happens next? Verse 15, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these yahoos? Peter, are you better anymore? Peter, how do you compare now? Ooh, Jesus cuts right to it, doesn't he? He's inviting him to be done with the comparison identity. And what is he inviting him to do? He's inviting him to say exactly what Peter says. Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. What is that? I've got nothing else to prove. And you don't have to compare me anymore. It's just about the fact that I love you. How about this? How about we not have to be the best Christians there are anymore? How about we don't have to be the Christians who know the Bible better than these other guys do? We don't have to follow the best YouTube preachers that there are out there. We don't have to be part of the perfect denomination. We don't have to be any of this stuff anymore. How about we could just be Christians? How about we could just be people that love Jesus Christ? Hypocrites, this is a house of hypocrites. We're just hypocrites, are we not? Yes, we are. Could we just be a people that loves Jesus? Period. That's what he's invited people, Peter, to. Next verse, 16. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Take care of my sheep, Jesus said. See, we know Peter's forgiven. We know that Jesus has on some level included him. But think about his mindset here for a second. Yeah, I could be forgiven, but I don't know if I'm still in the disciples' pack anymore. Because do I deserve that? And even if Jesus includes me in the disciples still, even if I still get to be in the club, I'm certainly not the leader anymore. Certainly I'm down at the end of the line. And I'm probably in the penalty box. Any ice hockey fans here? I'm probably in the ice hockey box or the penalty box for a whole long time because of what I've done. And Jesus, Jesus doesn't do that. Instead, Jesus comes and he says, take care of my sheep to him. Now, all this is really intentional. I would even argue that this is a ceremony that Jesus has set up. So everybody's here, everybody's fed, everybody's sitting around the fire. I need you to see all the disciples there with Peter and Jesus. He has made sure, Jesus, our Lord, has made sure that all the disciples are there to witness this moment happen. And I think they do notice. I think they're on the edge of their seats, listening to every single word. And Jesus says to Peter, take care of my sheep. Feed my sheep. Feed my lambs. Who feeds sheep? Shepherds do. We get the word pastor because pastor means shepherd. All a pastor is, is a fancy title for people who take care of sheep. Amen? Sheep in the church. So Jesus is essentially saying to Peter, you are lead pastor again. But Jesus, I haven't done anything to fix it. Jesus, I haven't waited long enough. Jesus, I'm not worthy. All that's true. But Peter, you're lead pastor again. That blows my mind. Verse 17. 
The third time, he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And this time, it's the third time, Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. So he does it a third time. Is that an accident? No. Peter had denied him three times. Jesus comes and restores him and commissions him back into ministry three times. And you notice Peter gets a little hurt. I don't think he fully understood what Jesus was doing. Jesus, are you twisting the knife about those? It's a surgical knife. Jesus is coming into his psyche, into the deep spiritual place. We all have it. And he's coming to each of those sins, and he's saying, I recommission you to pastor. I recommission you to pastor. I recommission you to pastor. And if anybody, of any of the other disciples from that point forward had any question about Peter's position, Jesus himself just settled it. He's not just forgiven. He's out of the penalty box. He's right back in his role. What do we do? We say in the church, we forgive you, right? We're good Christians. We're good religious people. We're good church people. I forgive you, but here comes the fine print. What do we say? I forgive you, but I won't forget. Come on. I forgive you, but I don't like you. I forgive you, but I won't promote you to Sunday school teacher. I forgive you, but I sure won't trust you. And we don't stop there. I forgive you, but I'm canceling you. Like, I'm going to bad talk you behind your back to our friends so that they cancel you too. I forgive you, but I'm blocking you, right? I forgive you, but I'm going to give you the minimum of my life. I'll be pleasant to you, Christian pleasant, right? We do that. (laughs) But I'm not really going to get close to you. You're going to get the minimum from me. I'm hopeless that you'll ever change. You're going to have to, we say these things. They're going to have to prove to me that they're different now. Did Peter? No. No. I think you owe me. Go into the penalty box for a while. I'll see you in a few years. I'm still really hurt over here. I'll protect myself from you. I forgive you, but I need you to prove yourself to me. I'll forgive you, but I will never let it go. That's what we're saying in all these things is I will never let it go. Don't we do the fine print thing? We do the penalty box thing. And... I'd say this, just like social media, we are so used to this. Are you with me right now? We're so used to this kind of broken forgiveness that we think this is the real thing, and it's not. That's not Jesus' forgiveness. That's a whole lot of religious junk. I'll take a better amen on that. It's a whole lot of religious junk, and we've settled for it, and we've built it into our marriages, and we've built it into our families, and it's killing us. And we walk around saying, you know, I've tried this Christianity thing. It doesn't seem to work for me. It's because it's not the right thing. Read the Bible. Look at what Jesus actually did. Because what did Jesus actually do? I forgive you, and he forgot Peter's sin. The scripture says, and God remembers our sins no more. Amen? Amen. And he liked Peter, and he reinstated Peter, and he trusted Peter, and he uncanceled Peter, and he never blocked Peter, and he gave the maximum of his love to Peter. He showed his hope for Peter. He paid all of Peter's debts. He brought Peter close to himself. He did not make Peter prove it, and he let Peter's denials go. Amen? Amen. Do you see the real thing? Can we do the real thing? See, I've blown it. Have you blown it? See, I could tell you the ways that I didn't forgive people over the years. I could tell you how I've done the wrong thing. Even as a pastor, I could tell you about my sin. I could list them off. So could you. Jesus had to forgive me massive things. Anybody in this room need Jesus to forgive you massive things? Anybody? I'll give you a minute. It's Easter. I'll give you a minute. You two in the gym, I'll give you a minute. Anybody need Jesus? 
Anybody need forgiveness? Anybody know what their past is? Anybody knows how long they need to be in the penalty box? Anyone knows how much fine print they actually deserve from his forgiveness? But he didn't give it to any of us, right? Because the resurrected king came charging out of the tomb to resurrect Peter, and he came charging out of the tomb to resurrect all of us. Amen? Would you guys stand? We're going to pray. Oh, Lord, we love you. Thank you, God, that you've brought just a touch of sanity back in our lives. Thank you, Lord, that you have a better plan. Thank you that it was in your word all along. It's hard for us to believe everything that you did for Peter so quickly and so without him proving himself or anything. Let that into our hearts today. I pray the light bulb could go on. Some of us in this room, some of us in the gym, some of us online. We came to church today believing that we had some work to do to get God's forgiveness. Would you convince us, Lord, that we've got none to do? That you did it all for us. And lastly, Lord, this Easter, I pray that you would reteach us how to forgive. Show us what Jesus honoring forgiveness actually looks like. Would you bring it into our marriages, Lord? We desperately need it. Bring it into our homes with us and our kids and us and our extended family, us and our church, God. Would you show us how to do this? We love you, Jesus. In Christ's name, amen.